Well, hey everyone, welcome to Reimagining Cyber Extra. So Stan and I have heard quite a bit from our listeners that, you know, it's great that you have all these guests come on, share a lot of interesting perspectives, have been doing that for now over two years, believe it or not. But, you know, it'd be great to hear from the two of you directly. So we thought, hey, why not kind of bring forward some of the recent relevant interactions and news that we're seeing out there, participating in, and just share that with you and see how that goes, right? So it'd just be very simple, casual conversation amongst us as to some of those activities, some of those engagements that we've had, and we'll kind of kick it off today. And Stan, why don't we give it to you? What have you been seeing out there? What have you been working on? What have you been hearing? Well, actually, one of the things that's really cool, Rob, you know, we've had Sean Tuma on our podcast twice, and I'd never had the opportunity to meet him in person. You know, COVID got in the way of sort of meeting people, right? Right, right. Um, I was in Dallas last week and had the opportunity to have lunch with him. Very cool. Um, nice. And again, for our listeners, one of the things that um, Sean is heavily involved with, with his whole security and privacy practice, right, is um, around cyber insurance, Yep. And, and and we talked about that just as far as how's it how's it been going and as far as his practice and all that. And it's been a down year. Hmm, really? I mean, I'm not I'm not saying Sean is specifically has diversified a bit, so his practice per se isn't necessarily down, but he had a an event with his peers last month. And um in general, cyber attacks in the US at least are down. So that impacts again the folks in his sector lawyers trying to protect you know respond to their customer needs right and then mm-hmm. um you know that he said some of the incident responders are laying people off wow yeah did, which, did he attribute that to like what's the connection point any thoughts well i mean the 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 the, the speculation i mean nobody knows for sure right but the speculation is that um a lot of the bad actors that perpetrate a lot of these cyber, cyber criminal kind of activities right are in Ukraine and Russia. Ah, yeah. So their energy is somewhere else at this point time for <laughs> either they're constricted, reasons. you know, and they're fighting a war or they're right. you know, fighting each other. And um, this is just probably a temporary blip in the radar screen. But um, uh, it's an interesting it, perspective, though. Yeah. 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 So I don't know if anybody else is seeing that out there. I mean, I think we're certainly seeing the headlines still. There certainly are attacks occurring. But in general, there is seeing a downward trend in, in, in claims to these cyber insurance providers. Uh, the IR folks were not getting as much business and the hmm. legal side wasn't seeing as much business. Hmm. But it was great to meet Sean. I mean, actually have a chance yeah. to just hang, hang with him and, and get to know him better. Great guy. That is always nice to have the opportunity, right? As, as you said, COVID's put a dent in uh, a lot of these face-to-face interactions. So it's great to hear that you did that. But you had one recently, right? Face to face, yeah. So, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty good, uh, sizable event, uh, interesting one. So, this is, I don't know, maybe a few weeks back or so at this point. And, um, so I won't share who the organization was, but basically, a very large US based telecom, um, mm-hmm. you know, do probably more of their business on the consumer side, uh, with their services, obviously, and products. And they do a great job annually of putting on a one day internal. Um, cybersecurity event or conference, really. And, you know, the, the keynote actually was done by Bruce Schneier, which was awesome, right? <laughs> wow. It, you it, want to give some people a background on who he is? Because so, again, so, not everybody may know. He's been around forever, but. He's been around for a long time. Um, he's been around since the creation of the internet, uh, as he shares. <laughs> and he's, uh, you know, one of the the the, the biggest minds in cyber and around cryptography. So right. he is like, you know, just so ingrained in the day and day activity that we're all used to doing now in cybersecurity that he has been involved with for many, many years. He's teaching policy at Harvard University now. Um, he has kind of his tentacles and every little thing uh, still to this point. He's just the passion, right, of cyber uh, just comes across. And, and he, he just he just did a nice job in going through kind of, you know, the the state of what he's seeing out there in uh, in the world of cyber. And one of the things he, a couple of things really that he emphasized that I took away is one, which I really love. And you and I talk about this all the time. It's kind of a key theme behind, you know, the uh, the show and, 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 and kind of at the core of why we even started this, right? Which is around cyber resilience, right? So now, now two years in 
And he was talking about that kind of maturation of, you know, cyber resilience and how it's just great to see that people are finally coming around to think of it in that regard. Um, and so, you know, some, some good things happening in that space. And the other thing that was really the main theme of the entire day, um, which he again included in his keynote, is all around the, uh, the, the need to secure the software supply chain. And so if you think about that, that translated into this particular uh, client of ours that we work very closely with, it, um, it was, I'll say it was very refreshing to hear what they're doing. Um, you know, we've, we've hear, hear to, what, hear what the, this, this, what the telecom is doing. This particular or? telecom is doing. We've, um, you know, we've worked with them pretty closely for some time now, but uh, mm -hmm. we've always had the discussions more so, of course, on kind of the security audience side of the mm -hmm. equation. And we talk about, right, that need to really balance things out with the dev teams and ingrain ourselves more in the dev teams and not slow them down. Just kind of really, how do you bake security in? They're doing it. And, you know, it's one of their key top three initiatives to continue to really drive that uh, relationship so that more of the security capability is in the hands of the dev teams. And the validation, you know, kind of uh, the gate checks, if you will, just are more seamless with security, you know, over the top with some more governance than anything else. So I was, I was just impressed because it wasn't just a cybersecurity leader within this organization that was uh -huh. sharing that. It was in true partnership on stage with the head of development as well. So the two of them side by side sharing that actual perspective. Which is so important. Going back to Bruce for a second, I don't, I don't yeah. know about you, but I, I always monitor his um, Schneier on security. Right. You know, he has that little blog yeah. and yeah. Um, he posts things that catch his eye. Snippets. Uh, yes. little, little snippets. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's in the news. Sometimes it's some kind of, you know, publication. He wrote the seminal book on cryptography. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's got another book coming out actually too. And uh, I want to say this, I don't know if it's January or February he was saying. So he, he used this as an opportunity to ensure people knew that was coming out. So <laughs> keep your eyes open for it. It was, it was so funny. So I, um, so I joined NSA, National Security Agency, back in 84, and I joined as part of um, something new, the Computer Security Center, right? And, and we did orange book evaluations, yeah, but okay. we were so different from the rest of NSA. All of NSA was about cryptography, right? right? And who were these weirdos over here publicly <laughs> facing? We had a multic system that had forms that were talk to vendors and, and you guys are doing what, what the heck is computer security? Right. You know, it's like, it was just this alien concept to all these crypto nerds, you know, and, and it was, um, it was kind of uncomfortable because we really were, you know, the black sheep at the time, you know, and now of course, you know, we, you know, the whole career, the whole industry has changed, right. And, and has grown, right. but at the time it was very odd. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, all of us, even though we were doing computer security, we all had three weeks of learning about crypto. Because if you're going to be at NSA, you better learn something about crypto. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting too is um, being, you know, as part of that that event with that uh, that telecom. It brought me back to my days being on the telecom side and running security as well. This is 20 years ago now, so it, it just it, it's just the kind of um, you know back then, and, and this was more of a backbone provider. That I was working with back then. Mm -hmm. And and all of that really was very kind of you know early stage security. It was firewalling, access control list, right? right? right. The basics at that point in time. And um, it's just crazy to think about like all of you know in that time frame, like you know, just being in the industry, how it's all about things, yeah, and that translation of like, yeah, when I was in telecom, it was all about the networking, and then we had this access control list and the kind of beginning of some firewalling. Yet now we're really talking about the kind of here's what's burning. How do you deal with the software supply chain? Well, here, these are the things we're actually doing. And, and, and you know, honestly, back then I was like, ah, oh, geez, I feel like we're so far behind with telecom. Mm -hmm. But being there, you know, again, a few weeks ago, it was like, they're actually kind of ahead of the curve now. And a lot of things that we've seen out there where, you know, they're not truly partnering up with the dev teams and, uh, and making that true embedding of security a reality. So it's just nice right. to see how that's happened. But one one of the areas that let's face, we all know is is sort of behind or is trying to catch up is whole operational technology. Yes, you know right. the OT sector, and mm -hmm. we've talked 
some about that right in our podcast episodes but i was at an event last week uh, that the department of energy sponsored mm. and it was called the energy infrastructure and environment summit and and and, and part of this is the whole exercise of trying to share from the government, what the priorities are, what, what are they doing, some of the ways in which they're trying to move the needle. You know, we have this infrastructure bill. You know, what does that mean to the industry? I mean, $68 billion associated with green infrastructure. Hmm. How can we actually help ensure this time around we build security in right. as they build that out? Um, you know, because everybody wants to. You know, like I have solar panels on my house now and I want to have visibility into, well, you know, what does that mean? How am I reducing my energy bill? Everybody wants visibility into the grid. Well, it's not made that way right now. Yeah. Um, and, and so how can you actually provide access, but also control access? Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that uh, was new to me that I heard about at the event was a new guideline from DOE called cyber informed engineering. Hmm. Okay. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of that, you know, it offers a framework on how to engineer out cyber risk throughout the design and operations lifecycle. And it's, it's really tailored for those OT engineers and operators. Yeah. So yeah. kind of a build security in, but really right. with an OT focus, recognizing they have a different world than the IT side of the house. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're hoping that, that, you know, that guide will, will help with the decision process of how to apply those kind of controls to eliminate some of these um, avenues of, uh, of attack that can occur in the OT environment. It's kind well, of cool. It is cool. And I'm glad to hear it because, I mean, we know, right, from the critical infrastructure side, it's, it's, it's been neglected, right? It hasn't been thought about. And, and obviously, some events have opened people's eyes. And obviously, current events are making it even that much more concerning. We've had some guests on to talk about that. I think we actually, now that you said it, we need to actually get some more guests on that topic going forward right. because it's so prominent, right? But I'm glad to hear that they're actually truly looking at ways to embed it in. And it's coming very much from the, the government perspective, because, you know, I think back to just a few years ago on kind of the medical devices side of the equation, right? And IoT and all these connected medical devices. And, you know, there's actually a lot of good security that's occurring. Yeah, actually, I, I think we, we spoke to uh, that products, product security um, director at Siemens, right? Brett Harris. We did. About yes. how, yeah, how he's actually helping build security into the medical yes. devices that they've got. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think, again, sometimes people aren't thinking about those things, right? Like we, we know, right? The connected device is basically vulnerable. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't care if it's a, if it's a Tesla, right? I don't care what vehicle it is, if it's a medical right. device, right? All these type of elements as you're talking about critical infrastructure, um, you know, we had an ink shot member talking about IOT security and a lot of the research that she's Connected doing. Vehicles. Canada. Exactly. So I think, you know, it's just, it's good to start seeing more emphasis on it because it truly is the kind of that next level of the attack surface of, you know, how much security is really being baked in. So to hear some of these things actually coming into the design phase is really great. One of the interesting areas that they talked about on the panel was you have this executive order from Biden around zero trust, right? Mm -hmm. Or it has zero trust in it. And how do you apply zero trust to the OT environment? Yeah. It breaks. You know, you you can't just try to shove zero trust concepts into OT. It takes re-architecting in many cases. And, and then, you know, part of the observation was, look, it's a marathon, right? It is not a sprint. The use cases will vary. Areas of focus, if you go back to the CISA, uh, you have those different areas of focus, whether it be on network or data or identity. Right. An organization may pick identity. Another one may pick data as far as where to start their, their race. But it's, it is going to be a challenge and those kind of operational technology environments to apply zero trust without impacting operations. Yeah. And so that was an interesting conversation. No, that's a great point. That's a great point. Now, Stan, you know, I'm going to wrap things up, but before I do that, you know, you're somewhere now and there's something else going on, yet another event that you're going to be speaking at. Maybe you can kind of give the audience a little glimpse into what that is and what you're going to be covering. Yeah. I'm in San Antonio right now. Uh, We have the 
AFSIA Alamo TechNet conference coming up this mm. week. And I'm speaking tomorrow on securing the software supply chain. And it's really around how we can um, look at the supply chain risks in a way, you know, that we understand the use cases. There are those that are intentionally trying to actually in, inject malicious code in the supply chains, a la solar winds. You also have you know, unintentional introduction of risk by mm -hmm. consuming software components that may have vulnerabilities in them. And how do you put in place mitigations for both of those kind of scenarios? Um, I think it's, a, it's you know really relevant right now as far as yeah, a lot of organizations are concerned about both use cases. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to a, a good conversation. Good, I'm sure it will be for sure. It's very, very much the, you know kind of top of mind for, for many people. We've been talking about it just today, right? Some of those different uh, examples we were sharing. So I hope everyone enjoys this. Something different for us. We'll see if it works and we'll continue it if it does, right? So thanks for joining us today. Looking forward to the next time. Till next time, Rob.